Black History. So we're here uh, at the Washington Cemetery. When I asked everybody last week uh, to vote on what they wanted to see for the topic of this episode, uh, the, the interesting gravestones of, of cemeteries was overwhelmingly uh, the winner. So uh, that's what we're, we're going with right now. Uh, so I am here with, uh, with Rich, a friend of mine who's just kind of a fan of, of cemeteries. So we're going to travel around a little bit and see some of the inter interesting graves and just tell some stories. So uh, it might be uh, there's some, some, I'll say humorous stories that go with it, some sad stories and just some, uh, some interesting stories that kind of go with, with the people that are here. And, and really, if you look around, everybody has a story. Uh, everybody here had a family, you know, had, had friends, family, uh, and they all have a story about them. Uh, but we're just going to pick pick a few and then maybe come back again some other time and, and do another episode. But uh, as always, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I, I'm constantly blown away by how many people are, are watching and, 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 you know, every week coming back, you know, getting thousands of views every week just, just blows me away. It really does. So uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we continue on, you know, hopefully it's interesting for you guys and you, you like what we have for you. As always, got to thank the uh, Washington County Tourism Promotion Agency for the, uh, for the wonderful t-shirts uh, that they give me. So, uh, so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Now, I will say uh, this episode is not live. Uh, to be able to get around to all the, the ones we wanted to go to, we thought, you know, it's probably not going to work trying to go live. Uh, there's going to be a lot of times where you're just going to see, probably have a close-up of uh, my face and Rich's face as we, you know, jump in his Jeep and drive around. And no one really wants to get that close to our faces. So, uh, so we're, uh, we're not live today. Um, uh, it, it has been pre-recorded, but we're just going around and, and filming some of these and, and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Uh, if you have any comments, please leave them. Uh, you know, if there's anybody there are any, uh, headstones, uh, that you might see, uh, that were in the background that you want to know more about, leave a comment. Maybe we'll come back again and do those. So, uh, I think we're going to start with, um, what do we want to start? We want to start with Boone? Sure. We'll start with, uh, with a congressional medal of honor recipient. Um, Hugh Boone? Hugh, Hugh, Hugh Boone. Patterson Boone. Hugh Patterson Boone. Uh, so we're just going to skip down there. We'll be back in just one minute. So we just got caught in a little bit of rain heading to, uh, to Hugh Boone's uh, uh, grave marker. Uh, but on our way, uh, I decided to stop here first. Um, uh, this is the burial site of Thomas Hanna and Sarah Foster Hanna. Now, Sarah Foster Hanna is, she's really one of the reasons we're standing here today. Uh, she was the principal of the Washington Female Seminary, uh, which I talked about when, uh, when talking about Washington Jefferson College. Uh, she became principal there in 1840 and would serve until 1874. Uh, and then uh, she retired, uh, continued to stay here in Washington, uh, did a lot of community service up until she passed away in 1886. Now, why is she the reason that we're standing here today? Well, in 1852, while serving as, uh, as uh, principal of the, uh, of the seminary, she called on some of the more prominent families of Washington to meet at the female seminary. So families like the Lemoyne family, the Baird family, the Atchison's, um, the McKinnons, called on these families to come in and sit down and talk. And what she wanted to talk about was the formation of a new cemetery. Washington had a smaller cemetery in town, uh, but she saw a need to have a larger, grander uh, cemetery. And so it was that meeting that the, that the cemetery was chartered out of. So we could really trace this, this cemetery back to 1852 because of Sarah Foster Hanna seeing a need for this greater grander cemetery and so this is where she uh, was laid to rest in 1886 after having done so much for the town not just the cemetery not just the 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 female seminary she did work with Washington College uh, she did work with the with the local hospitals uh, and she did a lot of work with orphan children uh, she is a very important person when you look at the history of Washington, Pennsylvania, and Washington County. Okay, so here we are at the second gravesite we're going to be doing today. 
Uh, this is the gravesite of Captain U. Patterson Boone. And his claim to fame, notoriety, is he was a recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor, and as most everybody knows, that's the highest award you can receive as a soldier in the military. Uh, he received this citation during the Civil War. Captain Boone had a very distinguished career during his term in the service. Uh, he received a neck wound at a battle in Withville, Virginia, and it was this wound which the, the bullet passed through his neck, barely missing his spinal cord. And that wound was probably the major contributing cause to his illness later in life, which brought about his death in 1908. Captain Boone lived his life in Washington, Pennsylvania after his term of service. Uh, his address was 217 Jefferson Avenue. And if you look that up now, that is the present site of the Subway uh, restaurant on Jefferson Avenue across from Wash High School. And for th those of you older people like me, you will remember that as Winkies back in the 70s. <coughs> um, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for personal bravery, gallantry in battle. During the Battle of Sailors Creek, Virginia, he rode through the rebel lines on his horse, killed the flag bearer, and captured the flag. So not only did he capture the flag, but he actually touched an enemy in battle. Uh, pretty much one of the bravest, most gallant things you can do during a battle. And later life, he was employed as a clerk at some mercantile stores in Washington, a couple of different ones. He passed away in 1908, and from what we've been able to ascertain, he had quite a few people at his funeral because he was a very well-respected man, very successful, and just an all-around good guy. And the fact that he received the Congressional Medal of Honor is just the highest testament to what a, an amazing, wonderful, and brave man that he was. So we're standing um, next to basically the Morgan Circle, I guess is what it's called. Yeah. Um, it's a uh, fenced in area that is basically all the Morgan family. So you have the Morgans, the Watsons that are, you know, that married Relative, into the, married yeah, married into the Morgan family. Uh, but the two right here, uh, I want to talk about first, and that's Mary Baton, Baton, Baton uh, Morgan and Colonel George Morgan. Uh, so Colonel George Morgan, if you've been up towards um, South Point, you've seen Morganza. Or, or, Morganza Road. Yeah, Morganza Road. Uh, actually, the building I guess is gone now. Yeah. Uh, but it was you know it was the the care center. It was a boys' school and yep. a care center. But it was named after Morgan's farm called Morganza. Morganza. Uh, it was actually a, a farm that was uh, bought by Morgan's brother, who had planned out here. He planned on moving out here. Mm -hmm. And settling down but when he died he left the farm to Colonel George Morgan uh, who was a Red <coughs> war veteran um, uh, trader uh, yeah. part of a trading company yep. uh, but his what a real let's let's do the trading company first and then I'll talk about okay, the, well, the, the trading company was called the Baton Wharton and Morgan company um, they were based out of Fort Pitt present-day Pittsburgh at the Forks of the Ohio in the mid to late 1760s and it was everybody thinks of fur traders as the mountain man era the 1840s and stuff but it actually started much earlier than that um so they would go out uh this was the infamous or the famous long hunter era where groups of men would go out into what was known as the middle ground across the ohio river and such and bring back deer skins for the leather and fur trade and everything and the Baton and wharton and morgan company was one of the largest uh, fur trading outfits back then. They had a place in, again, Fort Pitt, and also one out in Kakaski, present-day Kakaski, Illinois. So it was, it was a pretty big corporation. And then, of course, Mary Baton, Morgan, you know, that's, that's undoubtedly how George met Mary, was through one of the, what's the word I want to use, associates of the company, or, or officers of the company, and that's probably, I don't know if it would have been a marriage of convenience, um, but you know, irregardless, that's more than likely how they met. So, and so, um, you know, like I said, you've heard of Morganza, even if you didn't know what it meant or why it was <laughs> called that, you've probably heard of it. But probably the thing that I find most interesting about Colonel George Morgan uh, actually is tied to his son, Thomas Morgan. Uh, so, Hamilton is real big right now with Alexander Hamilton. 
still mm -hmm. big you know just just came out on uh disney plus disney or whatever plus, it yeah. is and so people are watching it again uh and you know you get to hear about aaron burr uh, yeah and and actually i've never seen the music so i have no idea i've never seen the musical okay. either now. so i don't know if they go into the burr conspiracy or not if there's anything about that but basically it was a whole conspiracy by aaron burr to almost form his own state maybe his own mm -hmm. country out here mm -hmm. Uh, and what's interesting is the whole um, conspiracy was broke because of Colonel George Morgan. Aaron Burr came mm -hmm. to Morganza to meet with uh, Thomas Morgan. And so they all have dinner together. After dinner, Thomas and Aaron Burr go for a walk. When they come back, you know, Burr kind of says his goodbyes and heads off. And Colonel George Morgan says, all right, what was that about? and kind of presses Thomas to find out that Burr was trying to recruit mm -hmm. Thomas into, into this whole conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And so Morgan writes a letter to Thomas Jefferson and says, listen, you maybe need to know what's going on and kind of lays everything out. That is what gives um, Jefferson cause to really start looking into it. Mm -hmm. And that's what breaks the conspiracy is because of Colonel George Morgan writing uh, that letter. So. So it's and, just kind of, you know, neat right here in Western Pennsylvania. Yeah, as you say, and that's the beauty of this little county that we live in is in, until you really start investigating and, and coming up to the cemeteries like this and looking at the names, you don't really realize how much fascinating history we have in this county. Yeah. I mean, we've got so many famous people and, you know, we're going to talk about a few of them today and, you know, in the future and everything, but Washington County is a really cool place to live. Yeah, it really is a lot of great history. Now, the one thing I will, I, you know, I don't know the history behind them, uh, but in here there are two or three infant graves, mm -hmm. um, which are probably more of the uh, more ornate <coughs> infant graves you're going to see. Normally, what you would see a lot of times um, is a infant would be buried um, either in the same plot as, you know, an There's older... a headstone right there with two names on it for Brownlee, and it says also an infant son. Yeah, so they, so. they wouldn't have paid for their own own plot, yeah. you know, for an infant. Uh, you know, because so many, so many children died at, at childbirth yeah. or, you know, within the first year. Cholera epidemic, smallpox, right. everything. So it, it was a rough life, too. But, yeah, they, there's the, the three neat uh, infant graves here, uh, here in the Morgan uh, circle. So, um, all right. Well, we'll move on to the next one. Maybe we'll do, we'll try something a little more lighthearted after ending with infant death. So, <laughs> yeah, probably right. a good idea. <laughs> so, uh, we're standing here at another... Um, Another headstone. Why are we here? This is one of those headstones when you see the name, and, and, and my fellow 80s children, and for that matter, 70s children, will get this immediately. The headstone we were at right now is of James T. Kirk. Space, the final frontier. Not the James T. Kirk that you're thinking of commanding the USS Enterprise, but Colonel. And he was a um, he was a Colonel during the uh, during the Civil War. Yep. Uh, actually served during the Civil War. Uh, was from Washington. Uh, so we were just driving by and we saw it. Uh, so I didn't have time to do a ton of research on him. But he is from <laughs> he is from Washington. Uh, and he was a member of the 10th PA uh, Volunteer Regiment. Yep. So another regiment that was primarily formed out of Pittsburgh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, primarily so. formed out of Pittsburgh, but it was before the 140th. So a lot of, a lot of guys went up to Pittsburgh to enlist, and then later on the 140th was formed. Yeah, so. yeah the 10th Regiment I believe, was the earlier of the regiments, and that was before the war started becoming, I, for lack of a better term, more popular to enlist in. Yeah. So. But at any rate, Washington Cemetery, James, James T. Kirk. Kirk. And how perfect would it have been if he was a captain? Yeah. So we're standing at the marker of Thomas McKinnon. Uh, he was a doctor in Washington, highly respected doctor in Washington. Uh, acted as a mentor to a lot of the doctors that would come about in the, um, in the late 1890s, early 1900s, that were responsible for, for developing really uh, what would become Washington Hospital. Uh, he was the son of uh, Thomas McKean Thompson McKinnon. Um, 
and uh, TMT was a uh, congressman. He was uh, on the cabinet for uh, President Fillmore. Uh, he was involved in a lot of local politics early on, but then became a representative uh, from this area in the 1830s and 1840s. Uh, and he died in Reading, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a lot of McKinnons uh, in this uh, in this area right in here. Uh, and you find that McKinnons are of, of great importance to Washington County history. Uh, just about every, uh, every generation of McKinnons made some sort of impact on Washington County. And we, we selected this stone uh, not only because of the history of it, but because of the photograph that's on it. There's actually this wonderful photograph that shows a family reunion from 1916. Uh, and uh, you know myself and Rich, we just really love the, the stones where you see photographs like that because even if you don't know who the people are, it gives you just a little bit more insight into who they were and into their family. So right now we're here at the Yablonski Memorial. Uh, Joseph Jock Yablonski was born on March 3rd of 1910 in Pittsburgh. His family had immigrated from Poland earlier and uh, pretty much as soon as he got old enough, he started working in the mines. Um, pretty much immediately when he got into the mines, he realized how bad the conditions were for the workers and he started getting really involved in UMWA. Part of this was the fact that his father was killed in the mines and that's what prompted him to get very involved uh, in the safety aspects for the workers. In 1969, he ran against Tony Boyle, who was the current leader of the UMWA. Uh, he accused Boyle of nepotism, misuse of union funds, and pretty much all kinds of other bad stuff going on in the union. Uh, needless to say, Boyle didn't take too kindly to this. Uh, Jock Yablonski did lose that 1969 election but he had pretty much upset Tony Boyle about as much as he could. And the end result was Tony arranged to have Yablonski murdered. In December, later that year, um, two men came to Yablonski's house in the afternoon and they were going to kill him. His daughter answered the door and they asked if dad was home and she said, no, he's out campaigning. Um, and they lost their nerve and left. Well, they ended up coming back December 31st, New Year's Eve, came into the house at night and killed Jock Yablonski, his wife Margaret, and their 25-year-old daughter Charlotte, murdered in cold blood. So it took several years of investigation from the local authorities, and they finally exposed a very large corruption ring within the UMWA. Tony Boyle ended up serving prison time. Uh, he died in prison. The three men that murdered the Oblonsky family also went to prison. Uh, the good thing about it is, if you can call it a good thing, is once all of this corruption was exposed, there were some serious reformations within the UMWA. So in spite of three people having to give up their lives, it did end up in resulting in, you know, in a good ending. But uh, probably one of the more famous infamous perhaps people buried in this cemetery. So we're here at the stone, the headstone of David Atchison. Now, if you remember uh, from, uh, wow, one of the first episodes that I did, uh, I talked about uh, David Atchison, you know, some of the veterans of the Civil War from Western Pennsylvania, uh, uh, James Perman and David Atchison. Uh, you know, I talked about and how he died July 2nd. Uh, at the Battle of Gettysburg, 1863, and that his men um, retrieved his body uh, and buried him uh, next to a large stone and carved uh, 140th in it. So uh, they would know where he was buried. And then after the Civil War, actually not after the Civil War, but after the Battle of Gettysburg, his family traveled out there. They found the stone, or found the stone, found his grave, and moved him here uh, back home to Washington where uh, they laid him to rest once again. And so David Atchison, Civil War veteran, uh, you know, uh, one of our heroes of the Civil War gave his life, uh, you know, to hold the Union together and, and uh, help end slavery, uh, buried here uh, in Washington Cemetery. So you can't go to a cemetery without stopping to pay respect to our veterans. Um, most of the graves that are behind us are relatively recent, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, World War II, Korea, 
I believe there is one World War I vet buried over there in an older grave. Um, but again, you have to stop and pay respects to our veterans. I mean, really, no matter what, you know, with, with everything that's going on today, you know, the protests and, you know, whatever your standing is or your beliefs in our country or, or your political beliefs, whatever they are, you know, these men still, they, they fought for our country. You know, some, you know, these men here maybe didn't give their lives, but they put their lives on the line for our country and basically for our freedom. And so, you know, you got to pay, at least pay respects to them. As, as the saying goes, they signed a blank check payable for up to and including their lives for our nation. And uh, folks, uh, I'm, I'm, I happen to be a son of the greatest generation. My father was a World War, or is a World War II vet. Thank God I've still got him with me. Uh, we're losing a lot of our World War II vets and Korea vets on a daily basis. So if you have a veteran, an elderly veteran in your family, please don't regret it later on. Take the time to talk to them, hear the stories, learn the history because all too soon it's going to be gone. Here's another interesting headstone that we found. Um, how often do you see a headstone anywhere with the title Sir Knight? You fight with the strength of many men, Sir Knight. And this one took a little bit of digging because obviously it kind of jumps out at you. Um, so Edward Little was born in 1836 in Longtown, England, and then immigrated to the United States. Um, he was a contractor and a builder, and, you know, not what you'd call the most standout person in Washington. One of the better families, they were very successful, but, you know, he wasn't like he was a politician or anything like that. But again, the Sir Knight tends to stand out. So we had to do a little bit of digging on this one, and here Sir Knight is uh, part of the Knights of Columbus. It is the highest order that you can receive in the Knights of Columbus, as I'm sure many know, the Knights of Columbus is the largest Catholic fraternal organization in the country. And they have levels one, two, three, and four. Only 18% of the men, I believe it's only men, I can't say for certain, but to join the Knights of Columbus only make the fourth order and earn the title of Sir Knight. And what stands out and when you obtain the, first, the fourth order, the Sir Knight title, is it is a level of patriotism because back when the Knights of Columbus were first being formed, uh, there was a big concern at the risk of sounding with the whole separation of church and state thing that everybody was thinking, oh, you're strictly for the Catholic Church, you do what the Pope says, yada, 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 you don't care about your country. Part of their creed uh, has to do with patriotism. So that's when the fourth order came into be and that's when you earn the title Sir Knight. So apparently here's a gentleman that immigrated from England and became an extremely patriotic American. So another fascinating success story. And I'm gonna slide in real quick. Um, probably the only time we're gonna be eye to eye. Eye to know, eye. Standing <laughs> downhill. <laughs> so uh, I just wanna say, what the reason we came here to this particular one uh, is one of the board members uh, at the Historical Society, uh, Brett Clancy, uh, he and his family we're walking up here, and I got a text from them months ago uh, with asking about this Sir Knight, uh, Edward Little. And I said, you know what? I, I don't know. I'll have to do a little looking. And I, I did a little looking and didn't find anything. It kind of slipped my mind. And uh, I said something to Brett. I said, oh, you know, you need to find that again and take a picture of the, of the stone for me. And he just did it, I, I don't know, probably... A week ago maybe he sent it to me and that's when I, I asked Rich about it. I said Rich I can't find anything what can you find uh, so we, we definitely want to thank um, thank Brett and his family uh, for for telling us about this one because it's a great story uh, and another one we were really hoping I was looking for this gentleman by the name of William Oliver William L Oliver because uh, I came across him and I wanted to find the stone so I found the story but couldn't find the stone yes. Uh, and William Oliver was a hat manufacturer in the early, um, early 19th century. Uh, so uh, sometimes starting around, around 1815, uh, and he dies around 1833. Now, the reason I think we can't find his stone is because I believe, just doing a little bit of research, that maybe his wife is buried here and it just says that he died yeah because he just disappeared 
uh, sometime around 1832-33. Uh, they said for several weeks leading up to his disappearance, he started acting strange. He was kind of what they, you know, I guess maybe what we would call off his hinges today. Yeah. Uh, just acting a little bit weird and disappeared. Well, what's interesting is that, you know, look at his, uh, we, we were trying to figure out why, and then we looked at his job his, title. His job title. Hatter. He was a hatter. And I'm sure everybody has heard the term mad, mad as a hatter. Mad as a hatter. The for, mad hatter off of Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. The, the manufacturer of hats with the, the wool procedure, um, mercury was used in the manufacturing process. And mercury will leach into your skin and it drives you crazy. You, you, you just, you, you lose your screws. Yeah. And so that, that was, there's where the term came from, mad as a hatter. You went mad when you were making hats because of the mercury poisoning. So we have, uh, we have one, well, not buried here, baby. Yeah, we but don't, know, at least, I don't know where he's at. At least a mention of him uh, somewhere in the cemetery. So if you're going through and you happen to see it, please message me. Please let, me let know, us know. Because I'd really like to see it. So yeah. that's, that's William L. Oliver, uh, died sometime around 1833. So if you find it, let us know. Let us know. So once again, I want to thank everybody for joining us for another laid back history. Thanks to Rich for uh, coming with me up to the uh, up to the cemetery, and thank you to the Washington Cemetery for allowing us to come up and film and and see some of these in, incredible graves and tell some of these amazing stories. Uh, I think we definitely need to come back. Uh, you know, Rich and I were talking about it. it'd be great to go hit maybe some of the smaller cemeteries around the area. I know West Ellick has a great cemetery there, uh, Claysville. So maybe we'll go hit a few more and do a couple more of these episodes in the future. Uh, so thank you everybody for uh, voting for this one because I think it's it's really going to probably be one of our best episodes. Uh, so thank you for that. Again, thank you to the Washington County Tourism Promotion Agency. If you want to help support uh, Laid Back History, uh, you can do so by donating at WCHS, uh, sorry, at WCHSPA.org. Click Donate Now or go to PayPal.me slash WCHSPA and you can donate there. Thank you everybody so much for tuning in and watching every week. Thanks again to, to Rich for, uh, for joining me. And we will see you next week for, oh wait, what are we gonna do next week? Um, so let's do the, uh, so the, the second, uh, second place in the voting were the, was the toll houses for the National Road. So next week, how about we'll do the toll houses? So Road join, trip. What's that? Road trip. Road trip, yeah, Rich. So maybe Rich will be with me again. Um, so we're gonna do the toll houses. So, Thank you again. We'll see you next week for another Laid Back History.